You see a lot of companies that they say, right, we're going to do an agile transformation and they change all the job titles, but they don't see that actually the reason why they are where they are is because they're not making any changes to the processes underneath. So they don't get the results they want. And a couple of years later, they kind of say, we tried Scrum, it didn't work. We tried Safe, it didn't work. Right, we're going to do DevOps. Sure enough, in two years time, that same company is going to go, right, well, we're now going to try team topologies because none of the others work. And they're not seeing that the actual root cause of the problem is the fact that there's no such thing as transformation, really, in my mind. That suggests that you're going from one point to another and you're significantly significantly better and really the goal should be about continuous improvement and just trying to make things better every day that works for you. Good morning, Jim Snape. Morning. How's it going? Yeah, it's all right, yeah. Good, thanks. Thanks for coming along. Little intro, this is where we test out your LinkedIn profile and see how, um, how much you cringe when I read it back to you. So uh, Jim helps organizations to find their value work towards goals and build a sustainable future. This happens through coaching and mentoring from a base of lean, agile and systems thinking. And the result means teams and leaders can connect their strategy to value. How does that sound? Yeah, pretty all right. <laughs> Sounds impressive, right? Nothing else, better mistakes, right? <laughs> well, not to me, but um, I can read my own typing, thankfully. But from the horse's mouth. Who is Jim Snape? Uh, I was once described as sarcastic and blunt northerner. That's probably about right. That's probably why I invited you on. Yeah, poss possibly, yeah. So, uh, just kind of like fairly down to earth. Uh, try and, try and like, I guess if, if there's an issue to say it, and, and try and be fairly open about that, but equally be relatively open about who I am as well. Like, I, I don't tend to hold emotions in. You know, what you see is what you get. Uh, and I think clients start quite like that because then they know where they stand with you and they know that you, you're you kind of supporting them in that way. And how did you get into this? Because I was doing some LinkedIn stalking. You started off as a photographer. At one point, you were a sales exec. Yeah. I don't want to, um, I don't want to assume because I, because of, you know, your accent similar. I don't want to assume you had a similar upbringing to myself, but uni, not uni, like how did, yeah, how yeah, did you no, end up? Um, so I started out as a photographer uh did that did that through college union to be honest that kind of that came from like, kind of like didn't really know what i wanted to do when i left high school and i was looking through the book and it literally said like engineering and photography and i just thought photography sounds cool give that a go so i did that for a bit uh trained became a photographer did that for five years photographing you know bins bollards and stuff for manufacturing companies some fun times um but i realized that wasn't really where i wanted to get to as a career uh Lots of stuff happened, a few different careers over over the next few years. And I kind of ended up in a call center at about late 20s. And I thought, this can't be it. Like This this is not, this is a job, not a career. This this is not what I want to be. And at the time, they were kind of going through a um, a fairly sizable transformation, actually, in lean, lean improvement. And I kind of saw it and I was like, this looks interesting. Uh, that might be what I want to do. And what I decided to do is kind of get like a five-year plan and go, what do I want to be in five years and what am I going to do to get towards that? Um, and then I started just following them, those areas. I kind of came in a bit early to see what they were doing, liked it, realized that actually I quite like process improvement. I actually didn't know anything about Agile at that point. I knew of it. I knew the name, but that was about it. And then worked my way through different careers, kind of in improvement in kind of, um management consultancy i suppose and then ended up in the world of agile as yeah as a coach uh, so and what are you up to at the moment uh working with a lot of clients really just to try and help them kind of do things a bit better maybe if they want uh obviously it's down to them uh support them a little bit in their kind of continuous improvement cycle uh and just kind of like make things better every day really i mean i came across you on on linkedin probably during covid um I am trying to make these conversations as diverse as possible. However, mm. we seem relatively similar. So I wanted to explore that. How did you start posting content? Like how did you, was it just a, a natural progression? Was there a, someone pissed you off one day and you thought I'm gonna start posting my thoughts and feelings? Because that's how you came to my attention anyway. And we've sort of had a, yeah. an online relationship <laughs> since <laughs> yeah. then. Um Pretty organic, to be honest. I just, I guess one day I decided that I quite like the idea of trying to sort of promote myself out there a little bit, you know, two companies and otherwise. Obviously, you've got to have the end game in mind with where do you want, where do you want to go professionally? 
Um, I just started posting. A lot of it, it's not planned. I don't even like schedule it. It's just if it comes into my head at that point, it kind of goes on LinkedIn. Um, I do try and avoid some of the sort of common pitfalls you see on there that people just post the same stuff or, or stuff for likes, you know, or, you know, promote, you know, edgy stuff to try and get like engagement. So I just kind of avoid all that. Just stick to the kind of, here's what I'm thinking about this particular point. What do others think? Yeah. And I guess it's about trying to understand what, what alternative viewpoints there might be. Because the thing in terms of diversity for me, it's about that really, which is, you know, it's about kind of knowing that there's different people think different things about a, the same subject. Yeah. What are their thoughts? Can I learn from that? Can I actually uh, become better as a result of it? You know, Does that ever get you in any hot water with clients or your employer? Have they been okay with it? Yeah, they're all right with it. Uh, I think if I started like posting something that's deliberately edgy or started like, you know, trade secrets or who we're yeah. working with, maybe, yeah. So I try to stay away from the kind of stuff that you shouldn't really speak about on the public forum but yeah it's, it's pretty uh, i try and keep it fairly what others would consider to be industry standard this was maybe from last week or the week before so unpopular opinion transformation is not the goal because if it is you'll be back at the start a few years later a few years later sorry ready to start again continuous sustainable improvement is where it's at change you can see improvements that actually are and results that make you smile God, what does like that mean? a sales pitch, doesn't it? What does that mean? Um, well, it means like don't go chasing magic beans, basically. So you see a lot of companies, don't you? They, they sort of like they, they say, right, we're going to do an agile transformation or something like that. And then they go off down that route and they change all the job titles and they change all the sort of events and so on. Um, but they don't see that actually the reason why they are where they are is because they're not making any changes to the processes underneath or the or the way that like empowerment happens. So they don't get the results they want. And a couple of years later, they kind of say, right, well, you know, we tried Scrum, it didn't work. We tried Safe, it didn't work. Right, we're going to do DevOps now. And then sure enough, in two years time, that same company is going to go, right, well, we're now going to try team topologies because that because none of the others worked. And they're not seeing that the actual root cause of the problem is the fact that there's no such thing as transformation really in my mind, because that suggests that you're kind of going from one point to another and you're significantly better. And, and really the goal should be about continuous improvement and just trying to make things better every day that works for you to get to you where you want to get to. Bringing it back to the current situation, mm. obviously keeping in mind client confidentiality yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But broadly, what are, what are the current challenges you're, you're facing or going through? Um, from an agile point of view, this isn't, uh, I don't want to try and make you cry. Or anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the main thing is trying to get leadership from a point where they think things are fine and the way that things are fine to a point where they realize that actually there's some challenges there and, and they can be part of the solution too. Uh, and it's not just about transforming teams at the bottom to make it work at the top. Um, I think another challenge is definitely around people believing that they're following a certain way and it works well for them, but actually just kind of like gently calling out where it's not working so good and, and giving them some some things to try to make things better. I think they're some of the big challenges currently. Yeah. And in terms of where, where have other organizations gone wrong and how do you take those lessons forward? Yeah, what, what are the lessons, what are the, yeah, where have you seen organizations go wrong in the past? I mean, you've had a hell of a hell of a career. Yeah, so far. Um, I think the main thing where it goes wrong is they they start with a solution and not necessarily the problem. I think that's the main thing that happens. So, like a call center that I did work at, you know, I remember them. They because they they'd sort of like read up about Lean Six Sigma and they literally got the book and tried to implement it. Like as the book says, you know, you should do this. You should have these events. You should put everything on a big board. But the thing that they'd not done is is actually worked out where they actually were. They'd not spoken to any of the 900 agents in the call center, which meant that when they tried to put their first improvement in, it actually failed massively. And it wouldn't have done if they'd just kind of spoken to a few of the agents and gone, well, that's why it is what it is like now. So actually this change won't, won't work. So we need to make a, a different change for now to get things better. And, and, uh, and you know, change takes time, right? So I think it's about two years. Um, from start to finish for a successful change. So just accepting that starting with the problem is probably the the best place to be and think about solutions down the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you were in the, the agile kitchen, if you like, oh, yeah. are there any specific, I'll keep it to three, ingredients you think help with that change? 
I think being open, uh, open to things being a bit different for definite. And I think being patient that it will take time and, you know, it won't be perfect from day one, but over time it's going to get better. Uh, and I think autonomy at all levels for definite, like, you know, you're not going to see that change if you don't allow the teams, you don't allow the individuals to, to be part of that change and actually make steps that they think will get to that point. Outside of the agile bubble, which can be quite, uh, can be a bit of a tornado sometimes. Mm. Where else do you take inspiration from or what, what should other people be focusing on outside of the usual scrum Kanban? Like what, where do you take uh, inspiration from? Yeah, a few places. Uh, strangely, the gym actually is one place because I, I see people at the gym. I follow a few like the PTs and so on. That's really interesting because you see it at an entirely different perspective. You see them setting the long-term goal that might be like appearing at a show or whatever and, and taking this, the small continuous steps to get there and committing to it. And I think that's quite inspirational. You know, like one of the gyms I went to, it had like a load of like, you know, buzzwords sprayed across the wall. And I thought these work really well in an agile setting, actually. Yeah. You know, like, you know, focus on the goal, um, commit to success, uh, push yourself. Little things that like make sense in a gym context, but equally would also make sense in a team trying to improve their ways of working. Yeah. Anything else? Any podcasts? Anything like, anything random? <laughs> films? Music? Uh, I tend to... I tend to quite like uh, the sort of, yeah, podcast wise, I suppose it's kind of agile, it's like the Lean UX stuff, I really like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, but just looking at sort of like humanistic behaviors well a little bit and, and understanding humans a little bit more because I think that makes a massive difference into the change we might try and look to make. Yeah. Understanding a little bit about that person, that individual, those behaviors and how we can work with those. So I take quite a lot of inspiration from like, you know, books like Surrounded by Idiots and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And other books of that nature to read about. In terms of leadership as well, like um, a lot of this sort of like, you know, David Marquet type stuff, uh, Daniel Pink, that, that kind of like leadership leadership stuff is quite good to read about because it gives you inspiration of what you might want to talk about next. Yeah. Like I said before, I think we're, we've got similar mm. sorts of, um, of thinking where do you think improvements could be made in the Agile community? Oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, without offending like 90% of LinkedIn. Uh, I think the main thing for me, I was thinking about on the way in actually, was I think dropping egos uh, and dropping this footballification that's going on at the moment between different frameworks versus other frameworks and my metrics better than your metric. Because I think if I was somebody that was starting out in the agile community, like no experience, no nothing from any background, I'd be really overwhelmed. Mm. So I'm kind of coming into an environment that where there's a load of people who are authoritatively speaking about their way of being the best way and, and, and so on and so forth and information sharing overload left, right and center. You know, where do you start with that? Where you might just think this is too much. I don't understand this. I'm going to walk away from it and do something different. Yeah. So I think in terms of like that, I think that's kind of where I think we as a community need to su support people get trying to get into it a little bit more and be a little bit more open to their ideas. Yeah. Perhaps. Being a bit more user-centric. Yeah, user a little experience. bit more user Yeah, because I think it's, we have to remember that's what it's all about at the end of the day, isn't it? It's about the people that we're working with. It's, it's about people, isn't it, basically? Yeah. yeah. You look at some of the threads that I've said this yeah. time and time again, and I think, I mean, it, it's, it's ideal for me, mm. but... Um, it would turn me off, I think, if I was new to this yeah. whole Agile thing. If I'm, you know, Steve or Sheila from HR. Well, massively, yeah. In company, what did I say, Smart smart Cameras Limited, mm. who wanted to, you know, think about improving the processes. I log on to LinkedIn, type in Agile, and look at some of the threads. I don't know, like you said, I, don't, I think it'd be quite overwhelming. Probably massively, wouldn't know yeah. where to start. And I'd probably think in these, these blokes, predominantly, they're all insert whatever word you want <laughs> and they're all sort of eating each other and not making it very accessible to the wider um to the wider work environment and i think that's what i meant by it's about user experience we need to make agile accessible um from every point of view but it's always interesting to hear other people's um opinions footballification i like that where's that come from i've heard of it but I... Well, I i just think it's like people make it about like oh my team's better than your team don't they like yeah. at the end of the day like you know scrum versus kanban safe versus scrum you know uh oh te devops versus topologies that sort of uh, it's this this 
this concept that somehow your way of doing it is better than their way and you're going to win a ma- win something yeah. and get to a result. But actually, nobody really wins, do they, in that scenario? No. And, and it kind of goes back to my point before around like trying to avoid those words because, you know, again, if you are that, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Business Owner and you're looking for somebody to help you, what do you actually want? You don't want to come onto it and go, well, we're going to give you scrum and it's going to make things better, right? You want, you've got business, you want it to grow, we're going to help you do that. So dropping all the terms, dropping all the kind of allegiances and just kind of going off into a world of improving something versus trying to just make it about you. I think that's that's the big thing. Yeah, sometimes. Definite. I'm sure I've been guilty of it. We have our scarves so tightly around our necks yeah. that we forget that there's, there's other stuff going on and it ends up strangling us. Um, do, you think there ever, do you think there is ever an environment where I use Scrum as an example just because... It's, it's relevant and popular. Do you think there's ever a time to bootstrap it? Or would you always be of the mind it's a bit like a pick and mix, like pick and choose? Um, I think there's definitely scenarios where you, you look at the client and you think actually a different way of working might be the way forward. So we had a client that were trying to use Scrum as an example, but they were a, a data engineering team and they had you know, multiple requests a day from areas of the business. And you th- you're looking at that and you're going, Scrum won't really work here because, you know, essentially you'd be sprint planning every single day. Yeah. So actually you should be f- thinking about flow. And I guess that's the point, isn't it? Like thinking about what you're trying to get to here. Is it about sustainable continuous flow? You might think Kanban might work for you better. It, you don't, you're trying to develop a new camera. You, you don't know much about it. You might use Scrum to get to that. So there are times where you might be a little bit more authoritative around the type of frame which you go for. Um, but I think that should only come after that you've had the conversations. And I think at the moment, a lot of people, they don't do that. They, they no. sort of like start off with the solution, which is we're going to do Scrum or we're going to do, you know, we're going to move away to uh, sort of DevOps. And then they forget that there's actually ultimately a, a problem that needs to be solved here. Yeah, it's got to be a collaborative effort, hasn't it? Yeah, it's got to be a collaborative effort. If yeah. you're going into a HR function. Yeah, exactly. You know, one of the options, practical stuff for those watching, listening, whatever, however you consume this. I feel, and again, push back, disagree, but it's our job sometimes to give people the, the facts to a certain extent. I think there is a time... You have to give people the theory for them to understand how to bend the theory sometimes. So if you're going into a HR function, for example, well, you you could use Scrum and you could use Kanban. You could use a mix of both. Mm. Give them the choice because more often than not, we need to give people a bit more credit. They will probably choose the right way for them to work. If you're in a HR function who's got shed loads of requests coming in from recruitment to, you know, um, pay rises, disagreements, complaints... Scrum's probably may not be the right fit for you, but that more flow-based system might be. But we need to give people the choice for them to to experiment with, I suppose. And if they did choose Scrum, that's fine. We can always. We can, I think people forget that you know we have we are allowed to change our minds. Yeah, absolutely. We're not we're not, we're not fixed in in that sense. Um, in saying that, based on some of the frameworks you've chosen, or in general. And again, you can stick to Agile if you want, or you can be a bit more broad. It's entirely up to you. Is there anything you've changed your mind about recently that you never thought you would? You know, I was, I was kind of hoping you weren't going to ask me this because I, I did think about this and I thought, is there? And actually, I don't know. I don't think there necessarily is. Um, That's okay, by the way. Yeah, no, Sorry. I don't think there is, to be honest. I, I think because I'm, I'm fairly... I just think that that happens because... M- Personally, I'm really quite open to being wrong about something. Mm. So uh, that probably happens all the time. I just don't realize it. I'm not sort of like welded into a set way of doing something and then realize, you know what, I, I've completely, you know, I'm saying this, I've been doing this myself, but actually it's the wrong thing to do. Because I tend to do that kind of continuously all the time, like always looking to see, well, actually, what do I actually do? Is this the right way of doing it? Is there a different way? Could I have done it differently? And, you know, yeah, I think you might have. I'm going to ask a selfish question now because you may have navigated this better than I do. And by the sounds of it, you have. How have you had to change your approach from being that open, honest, Mm. straight to the point individual, which you come across as and you say you are? I've struggled with that with some clients and I've struggled to change my own behavior. Like I am what I am. 
what you know what you see is what you get have you ever had to yeah temper that down that a bit yeah um and actually, how have you done it so we were asked one time in a company i work for like do you bring your true self to work and i and i said no i don't and and everyone was a bit like taken aback by that they were like well, what what you're hiding kind of thing i said i'm not hiding anything it's just that the, the gym outside of work is very down to earth you know probably swears more than i should um might say something that you know you that might be quite in your face kind of brick to your face kind of mm. so you might like it or not but that's just what it is that's how i am so like you say i've learned over the time especially working with like more bigger clients more senior people that you can't always be like that because ultimately it's just gonna it's gonna end up with you getting kicked out the door and down the road, right? So I guess finding that finding that balance of saying it how it is, but in a way that they don't realise that you've said it how it is. I think that's probably what I've changed is how I how I've done that, my approach to kind of giving them honest feedback. Yeah. From a cognitive diversity yeah. point of view though, it's got a bit I, I found it's a strength and people do do um definitely do appreciate yeah. it I so think. people appreciate the honesty but equally uh, it's how you it's how you deliver that message right yeah. so if you go into like CEO of a company and go your process is shit and you, you're doing a really bad job they're not going to like that it's going to bruise their ego they're going to go away from that conversation there might be a load of other things going on in their life that you don't know about like personal financial whatever and it's just a terrible time to have that message but kind of going in and going I'm seeing these things and I'm thinking these things. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Do you agree or not? Because chances are they're going to then go, you know, you, what you're seeing and what you're saying is exactly what I'm seeing and saying. So how do we fix that? Right, well, here we go. We can start speaking about that, yeah? Yeah. Versus that kind of like, you're already going on the back foot if you're going in with a load of problems, but no actual solutions because they're not going to like that. Yeah. So I guess that's, that's the main difference is that actually, again, goes back to that human factors, you know, thinking about, treating that individual as a human and and thinking about them as a person and what they want from it yeah it's going, really important yeah absolutely going back to what you just said i was thinking i think this came up on maybe it was with johnny williams on the, oh, the last yeah. round and we were talking about you go into the doctors mm. and when people i think it's an unfair question to ask do you bring your true self to work because you, if you go to your doctors and you go for your appointment and you've got something wrong with you. If we're honest with ourselves, do we really want our doctors, for example, to turn up and say, I'm having a really crap day? Mm. No, we want them to solve our problem. So it's a bit, I don't, I don't know if disingenuous is the right word, but I think we try and tell ourselves we bring, or companies would like to think everyone shows up in their true authentic way. But I don't think that's, that's the truth because sometimes we don't want people to do that and maybe that's okay yeah you've got to be a bit of a duck or a goose haven't you really and like yeah. be be sort of like quite you know i don't know quite vocal quite quite bullish but equally flapping away on the underside because yeah. i think i think that sometimes and, and it's a tricky one so sometimes you know you you actually show, showing a bit of that is actually a good thing the client realizes that you know um you're not sure about the solution either and you're not sure in the way forward but equally they're kind of paying you to do a job right and if you don't know how to do that it, it doesn't come across well if you kind of fluff it yeah so you, yeah it's, it's a tricky balance isn't it as to who to, how to bring yourself in and, and how to act yeah in different scenarios and it might change depending on the person i think as well massively change so if someone was looking to get into the sort of role you're in based on what we've just discussed in terms of there is an expectation with a with the the title of agile coach scrum mm. master kanban master whatever i think i just made that one up but you know that sort of role if you were to look back on your journey is there anything you'd do differently or any advice to someone watching i, I want to try that but i know there's a responsibility with that title and i need to know what i'm doing yeah um i think for me it's have a plan right so I, I used to i used to manage somebody that was like starting out in their career as a sort of junior product owner they they were a little bit uncertain and i was like well write it down you know where do you want to be in five years where do you want to be in 10 years you know what what does that look like what skills do you think you need what skills do you think you've got where are the gaps so uh you know again going back to the call center i knew i wanted to get to lean i didn't know much about it in between calls, you know, I sat there and I was kind of Googling about lean. I was writing it down in a book. I was learning about it. And everyone's kind of going, why are you doing that? You just chill. There's no calls. Just look out the window. So I was like, no, because that gets me to the plan. 
that gets me to where I want to get to in time and my knowledge. I know I don't know enough about this to talk about it, mm. so I need to learn more. So I, I do that and just be open to continuously learning. You never, it's not realistic to kind of go into it, you know, fresh face from a two day course thinking you're the best scrum master or coach ever. Yeah. You know, you need, you know, you're always learning. And if you keep that kind of approach with a clear plan, I think you'll, you'll get there with it. Yeah. Are there any resources you, um, go to or books yeah, you've yeah. read over uh, there? YouTube yeah. actually yeah. massively into YouTube. I think there's some amazing stuff out there. As long as you're open, that not all of it might be right, and and some of it might have people's personal opinions put on top of the knowledge. Yeah. Then I think it's a great, great place. Uh, LinkedIn books. You know, one of the guys I work with, he's he's a walking encyclopedia. He'll just <laughs> randomly reference a book in a call. It's great because then you think I've never heard of that book before, or actually yeah, I've got that, but I haven't read it for a bit. So you go back and reread it, and you learn about it. Yeah. Um. So I take inspiration from all kind of places, really. In that regard. Yeah. I'm trying to follow people who don't necessarily agree with. Yeah, I like, that's a good approach, I think. So on the on the drive in this morning, I listened to an hour of Nick Ferrari. Oh yeah. And then an hour of James O'Brien. Two completely different people with different uh you know, on the on the on the political spectrum. But the reason I do that and you could apply it to anything really is to have that balanced view. If I just listen to one or I just listen to the other, then I my, you know, my 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 biases would be completely skewed so i think you've got a just because you don't agree with or one doesn't agree with it doesn't mean they're necessarily wrong or that you know a difference of opinion is it's not binary is it i think we've lost a bit of nuance especially in in our community there's always a there's always something under the surface and what people post on linkedin is always going to be a bit restricted because they're potentially talking about current or past clients so you're never going to get the full story. Yeah. yeah, I think on that, like, that's something I've learned to do a lot over the years is, you know, not go all in when I see something on LinkedIn that I necessarily don't agree with. I might have done that at one point in my career, like kind of gone, oh, that's just rubbish. I don't agree with that. Here's why I don't agree with it. Yeah. Whereas these days, I'm probably more like, that's an, a way of thinking about something that I didn't think about. And actually, I don't really agree with it, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to wait. I'm going to listen to it a bit more. I'm going to think about it. And then I'm going to work out whether I actually do agree with it, great, or if I don't, why I don't agree with it and what I think could be done differently or said differently. Yeah. Um, and that's why I kind of avoid those posts on LinkedIn. They're all kind of like, you know, uh, my way of doing it is the best way ever and, and I, you have to do it this way because I think, who might I speak about that? Yeah. At the end of the day. So, uh, but equally, if I see a post like that, I'll kind of look at it and I'll go, hmm, interesting. I actually don't agree with that. I'm going to think about my response a little bit and then I'm going to say it. So I think it's kind of a good kind of middle ground. I apply the uh, chest test. Oh yeah. So you see something online and your hackles go up, your chest goes up. And at that point now I go, okay, I, I can recognize that. And instead of, and massive disclaimer, I still let myself down because I'm a wind up merchant and I sometimes get overexcited. And I like the the back and forth, especially when someone's being so ridiculous. I just like winding people up. That's a personality trait or a flaw, depending on your opinion. But and you feel your chest go up. That's normally a sign that you probably need to do what you've just said, take a step back. And more often than not, someone else will be silly enough to post what you're already thinking anyway. <laughs> and it's never going to look good on you. I think, so, so for example, um, saw a post a couple of weeks ago slating a job advert and it's like well you've got an open to work banner on your profile not you as in the person who posted it <laughs> how is that going to look if you know recruiters or hiring managers are looking at that person's profile and they're just slating every agile job advert out there instead of going Do you know what that's probably not that may be an opportunity to go and have the interview and point some of this stuff out. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that particularly on the way in actually about recruitment and I thought, I, I feel like we should really give some recruiters slack here because, you know, as a community, we don't help them and we don't help ourselves and in, at times with the approach, just, I see that as well, like, you know, that some recruiter, they, they've been told they need to get like, uh, you know, an agile coach or scrum master, they probably don't know a lot about it, so they do a bit of Googling, they look at other job adverts comparably put it on the internet and get immediately flamed by a load of people in their ivory towers saying, this isn't the this isn't what a scrum master should be doing, blah, 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 this is gonna fail, right? And then they just kind of like get demotivated by that. 
Yeah. They probably don't have any real control on what that job either is. They're probably not the hiring manager. They're told by somebody to what to write. So I think education there is useful. Here's some, you know, but actually, you know, one-to-one conversations, but equally, I think educating the wider business, you know, here's what to look for when you're, when you're looking at a role of this nature. Here's what you might want to think about. Here's some of the things you might want to not think about. I think that's the, the better approach than just kind of flame instantly flaming it. But that's the way the internet is, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody puts something online and 700 people jump off the keyboards and into it. And I think that's where I try and avoid doing that. I try and, like say, step back a little bit and go, am I actually helping the conversation by just flaming in with my opinion? Probably not. Yeah. So I'm going to just kind of hold back and then think, well, what would actually help this? So again, some of my posts on LinkedIn, I try to think about... If I was look a business or was a hiring manager looking for a new role, what would help me to see in terms of the information to get to that point? Yeah, and ultimately, if every job description was perfect, there'd be no need for us, would there? Of course not. No. So I see, I always see it as a bit of an in in terms of that isn't perfect. But if the organisation was perfect, they wouldn't be asking for help. Yeah, exactly. And if they that. weren't asking for help, we wouldn't be in, you know, in yeah. employment. So I, I, yeah, if you're gonna post something about a job advert. Just think about the person on the receiving end and ultimately it makes you look a bit silly <laughs> if someone was to, especially if you've got an open to work banner, I mean, come on, mm. that's, it's pretty, uh, that's day one, week one, I yeah. suppose. And, and on that as well, like, I think there's a lot of like, again, being mindful as a community, not to be too judgmental that somebody's starting out in that journey. Because let's say that's the first ever foray into the world about Jowaline, right? And they're starting out as a kind of a junior product owner or, a, you know, um, I don't know, Scrum Master or whatever, or even just starting as an Agile coach, you know, they probably don't know everything, but they equally probably know a lot that you don't know. Yeah. So kind of supporting them by kind of going, well, what can I learn from you equally? What can what, what can I help you with to get your development going forward, which will gen- overall help the client? Yeah. I think that's a great approach. Certainly when I used to manage a few junior project managers in, in a previous life, that's what I tried to uh, apply that upside down management thinking, well, what would help them develop? Because... You know, I think it's a bit arrogant to think we know it all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you see it, yeah. And on that as well, little rant here. You, you know, a lot of times you see it like, oh, just a scrum master, just an agile coach, senior agile coach. Well, fine if that's your job title, but don't don't act that way to people underneath you. Like, don't think, oh, I'm a senior agile coach, therefore, you know, these these little agile coaches and scrum masters at the beginning, they're you know, uh, they don't know anything. I'm going to tell them how they should do it because that's just arrogant, right? It's not going to help anybody. And it's not going to help the client if you're just kind of micromanaging those people that yeah. you're working with as well. So, yeah, totally agree. And I think we forget sometimes as a communi- community, mm. it's a big community to us, but it's still very, very niche. And it's a bit of five degrees of separation. It's the same with recruiters, <laughs> tech recruiters. They all probably not maybe not know each other, but there's probably not that many steps between them knowing each other. So if you're slating someone because they've written their first ever job post as a junior recruiter or a junior X, Y, or Z, I just think it's a bit silly. And, and like you yeah. said, yeah, it doesn't. It's not. It's not a, an inviting place for a junior product owner you know or a, a new product owner not a junior product owner that was a mistake but you know what i mean some a newer product um owner or product manager or even a product like a a project manager like we, we just need to be a bit more um accessible i think yeah because you never really know when you're going to come across you might come across that person again in your life a few years later and if you burn that bridge it's going to be really difficult yeah and like you say it's a small community right ultimately so you are almost certainly going to come across that individual repeatedly so there's absolutely no point in trying to burn a bridge early doors because it's not going to help you in the long run. No, and some of the best conversations happen naturally. Like I've just apologised for saying junior product owner there because mm. I know someone will be thinking, "Oh, that's wrong." Should like should I be in the position? Should I have to do that? Probably not. But because of the the flames that get fanned, mm. you know, you feel like you have to to, to apologise straight after something sometimes, and that's not. You know, that's not a great position to be in if we want people to feel like they can cont- uh, contribute. What's next, Jim? What have you got in the pipeline? What's coming up? What are you up to? I don't really know. Uh, I'm always trying to think of what the next step is. Uh, I think probably something in the Agile space, but I think I'm moving away almost from it, weirdly. I'm becoming more sort of general business improvement, business business transformation kind of world 
So I think I'm going to start learning a little bit more around getting back into the Lean UX side of things, learning a little bit more around that because I think that's useful and probably try and go on my coaching side a little bit because ultimately, even though it's in my job title, you know, I have done some professional coaching stuff, but actually trying to build upon that would be really great, I think, because I think that's where you can really help an individual by actually remembering that you're a coach and actually giving them actual coaching. Uh, we We kind of like... One of my LinkedIn posts was actually that exact point, actually. That post was around that, like loads of people these days are a coach, right? They say, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business coach or whatever, and they're not actually coaching. So That was the post I was on about, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, that was it? the post so, you on about, yeah. I'm just going to say it. If you're a coach on here and your service is telling the other person what to do, then you're not a coach, even if it is in your job title. That's the one that I mixed up before. Yeah, it's all good. No, uh, so that was about like, and it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about what's next. Everyone's a coach these days right on LinkedIn or whatever the business coach and you know if you've set a business up and it's doing really well does that make you a coach not really it makes you a mentor it makes you you know a guide to others right so people put like you know agile coach and then they start they're telling people what to do next that's not coaching coaching is actually working with that individual to unlock potential within themselves and support them in identifying a path forward so for me if anything else, that's that's what I meant by that post. Is like, if you're going to say you're a coach, then actually coach. If you're not going to coach, be really honest with the client. You know, sometimes we'll 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 do some chatting with somebody, and I kind of say to them, "I'm going to offer you some mentorship now." So I'm stepping out of the coaching space. I'm just going to give you some guidance, just to be really clear. That's what I'm going to do. Do that, fine, and then switch back into coaching if you're going to coach them. Then that can really support them. Yeah, uh, and not and yeah. So I think for me, uh, that's what that post is about. But yeah, generally speaking, in terms of like what's next, I think it's getting into the coaching world a bit more, actually learning a little bit about what it means to be a coach, stepping back, checking my ego, checking my inner sense that says, I know everything about this. And so it was actually thinking about, well, what does that person want to do? What's in them potentially? What what getting them to think about their the reality, their options, their way forward and actually support them with that, I think is the, kind of the next steps. I like that. And I definitely think there's a great point there around the difference between coaching and mentoring because both are valid, but there is a difference, right? I see mentoring as some broad example. Someone is living, someone has got a successful business. I'll keep with your example. If I want to know how they got there, I don't want to be coached into it. I want, I, want, I want them to tell me how they did it so I can take inspiration from it. I don't want to be asked powerful questions mm. because I want to know how they bloody got there. And having that, I think there's nothing wrong with either, but I think having that distinction, are you in that mentoring stance or are you in that coaching stance? And more importantly, what do you need from me? Do you want me to do you want me to listen and ask questions or do you want me to give advice? So I think that's really important. Yeah, well, no, I, uh, I read a really interesting book uh, by a guy called Nara McShane, Responsive Agile Coaching, and that blew my mind a little bit when I read it. Because that for me was like how I was already doing it but I thought that's a really great way of like others doing it too. And it was kind of that, again, that concept of speaking to somebody and doing that sensing, that was sensing before you do any kind of responsiveness. And like you say, either kind of going, actually, no, this person doesn't need coaching. So asking them, well, you know, what would you like to do next? What are your options? Isn't going to help them. So you go down that co-creation, right? I'm going to help you create something, but I'm going to give you some mentorship to do that and that, that we're going to go forward. Or kind of going, no, actually coaching will work here and stepping back and kind of going, well, I know what I do here and I know what I could tell you, but let's just forget about that. What, where do you want to get to? You know, what's your goal? What's your reality? What options have you got? What are you going to do next? How committed are you to it? And coach them to the future, I think is uh, kind of super important. Yeah, it's the same at home, I think. Do you want me to listen or do you want an opinion? And giving the person that choice is important sometimes because sometimes people just want to rant and that's fine. But as the, the person on the receiving end of that, checking in with them and saying, yeah, like I said, do, 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 like, do you want me to listen here? Because I have got opinions, but if you don't want them, that's fine. Or do you want to have a conversation? Or do you just want to rant? Yeah. And I think one of the best things an agile coach can do, in fact, you know, anybody going to get into the coaching space or the sort of scrum master space or facilitation, the best thing you can do with anybody is just kind of go into that room and go, I'm not going to, I'm going to keep all my thoughts, all my opinions to myself, and I'm simply just going to sponge. Yeah. For the next five to 10 minutes, I'm just going to sit there and listen and watch. And I might make some internal observations, but one thing I'm not going to do is suddenly call it out or say, do differently. Because 
I think that's how you get to the point where you can identify what the real problem is. And then you can get that kind of, you ask them, well, I'm seeing this, what are you seeing? Actually, yeah, similar, great, what are we gonna do about it? Yeah. And I think that's the way to start like a really powerful conversation. There's another book actually, I don't know if you've read it, but just to add to the one you mentioned called The Advice Trap. Oh yeah. And it's the second book, the follow-up to the coaching habit, you know, about the seven, seven coaching questions. And The Advice Trap is essentially by the same author, and the premise is our advice is nowhere near as good as we think it is. Let the people speak, let them let them get it out, listen, and then potentially pivot to, to whatever we need to do. Love that. Where can people reach out if you are willing? Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, connect to me. I'm, I'm always up for connections and learning about new things. If you connect to me and the first thing you do is offer me courses, I'm probably gonna block you. But you know, if you wanna connect and actually like, you know, learn a bit more about me and I can learn about more about you, that's great. Company to work for, agility.inmind. They're really great. We're kind of a consultant that helps support businesses. So look, look us up. Uh, we, we can come and support you where we can. Thanks for coming on, mate. No worries. I'm sure people get loads of value from it. Could have, could have chatted all day. But unfortunately, you need to get off. You've got work to do. You can't just be sitting around here with me all day. Thanks for coming on. No, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this month's episode. If you enjoyed the conversation, please let us know in the comments and also tell your mates, like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.